What I want to share with you tonight, I really feel impressed to the Lord to share with you a series during this weekend uh, from the life of Joseph. We're just going to teach on the life of Joseph. And I know that a lot of people aren't really excited about things like this, and they say, oh, man, I want to learn about healing, or I want to learn about this. But, you know, these are the things that God has used in my life that have changed me. This is how I learned these things that God has done in my life. You know, there's a passage of Scripture over here in the New Testament. This is in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Let me just read some of this to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1 says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. This is talking about, uh, this is talking to Jews and this is talking about their heritage that they all came out of the land of Egypt. They were all under this glory cloud of God and they passed through the Red Sea. And in verse 2, were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So the point that he's making is all of them had the same opportunity. The Lord brought all of these children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, and he didn't bring them out to die in the wilderness. It wasn't God's will that a single Israelite die in that wilderness, and yet all except for two people... We don't know exactly how many there were, but most people estimate that there were at least 3 million Jews or or more, 3 million and only 2 out of 3 million ever experienced God's best for them. And it wasn't because God willed it. It was because of their hardness of heart, because of decisions that they've made. And this is something that a lot of people don't like to face today, but your life is the way that it is because of your decisions. There's probably some of you that are here that don't like that and that came and you didn't want to hear that because what you're trying to do is say, no, it's not my decisions. It's because I was abused, because I had this done to me, because of this disease came upon me. I didn't do anything to occasion it. But really, the truth is, it's our decisions that either make you strong in the Lord or weak in the Lord that make you susceptible to what Satan is trying to do in your life or able to overcome it. Your life is a complete, perfect representation of the choices that you've made. Now, some of you think, but I'm sick and I didn't choose to be sick. You may not have said, I want cancer. But what you did was make choices that kept you from understanding and knowing the power that you have and how to activate it and therefore made you susceptible to cancer. Amen? Man, I'm just barely getting started and some of you are already looking at me mean. (laughs) Some of you already act like you're upset. We're just getting the introduction down. The point that I'm trying to make is that you know what, many of you don't like this, but this is the point that he's saying right here. He brought all of these Israelites out, not so that they could die in the wilderness, but so that they could enter into the promised land, and yet not very many made it. Well, the Lord wants every born-again person, every person who has made a relationship with the Lord to be walking in health, prosperity, joy, peace. God hasn't made a single dud. God has not willed for a one of you to fail. Contrary to the religious teachings that go on today, God is not putting you through the valley. He's not punishing you. He's not forsaking you. He's not testing you. He's not trying to improve you through your suffering. God isn't the source of any failure in your life. If you're born again, God planted a seed on the inside of you that should be growing into a world overcomer. And you should be above only and not beneath, the head and not the tail. People tell me all the time, so I say, how are you doing? Well, not too bad under the circumstances. And you want to say, what are you doing under there? Amen. (laughs) Get out from under there. God doesn't want you under the circumstances. You're supposed to be above only and not beneath. You're supposed to be a world overcomer. But not everybody overcomes. So what do you do? Well, a lot of people come to a meeting like this wanting me to help you overcome. And you know what? Praise God, if, if the only way you could overcome was just for you to gut it out, grit your teeth, grow up, take five years to grow and mature, 
If that's the only way that God had to minister to you, a lot of people would be dead before they ever got hold of the truth and they wouldn't make it. So because of that, God puts people in the body of Christ that can help you, can encourage you, pray for you, and do things, and we're glad to do that. If you came here and you're desperate and you need a miracle right now and you can't grow, we'll pray for you and we'll help you. I love you enough to minister to you right where you are, but I love you enough not to leave you right where you are and tell you that you need to grab hold of the truth and you need to start learning and growing, and it's up to you whether you prosper. It's not up to God. God has already chosen for you to prosper and for you to be victorious, and if you aren't living a victorious life, it's not God that's at fault, it's us. So I'm going to be sharing some things with you from scriptures. These scriptures are ones that God has impacted my life with for over 30-something years, and it's made a difference. And if you will receive it, this is what makes me tick. This is how God has ministered to me, and I promise you, if you like the results, if you want to see God moving in your life, well, then take the things that God has used to minister to me and apply it to your life. In verse 5, it says, But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Verse 6 says, Now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after things as they also lusted. Verse 6 says, All of the things that were written about the children of Israel happened for our examples. It was written for us. You know the reason that we have such a Bible? You know the reason it's so big and it's got so many things in it? God gave this to us so that we don't have to learn everything by hard knocks. Amen. Man, that is awesome. You know, I got born again when I was eight years old. And praise God. I mean, my mother told me not long ago that I never went through rebellion. I never gave her any grief or any misery, which, well, that was a blessing for me to hear that. I never went through a period of rebellion. I've always been seeking God. My dad died just after I'd turned 12 years old. That's been 44 years ago. And uh, I grew up without a dad. And many people would say, well, then you just couldn't have gone through life without rebellion and without all of these things. But, you know, it was before all of the psycho babble came out that we have today. And I didn't know I was supposed to have a problem. And the scripture says, if your father or mother forsake you, the Lord will lift you up. And I just turned to the Lord and God took care of me. And, and it was just fine. But you know how I learned a lot of things? I studied the Word, and through the Word, I saw other people that did things, and I saw what it did to them and what it did to others, and I learned through their example. That's what this is saying. This is the way that I grew up. You do not have to learn everything by hard knocks. The Word of God is written. If we would take it, it'll teach you everything that you need to know. Everything that you need to know is in the Bible. I know some of you don't believe that. I even went to a tent meeting one time where a guy said that, you know, he believed everything we needed to know was in the Bible. And the year before, he set up his tent and a wind blew it down. And he was saying, God, what was wrong? And he was studying the Word one day in Isaiah 54, verse 3 and 4 says, Lengthen your cords, strengthen your stakes. <laughs> and he said that the Lord told him what the problem was. And he fixed it and it lasted and there's no problem, amen. Everything you need to know is in the Bible, praise God. So in verse 6, it says, Now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters as were some of them. Did you know that Colossians 3, 5 says that covetousness is idolatry? Desiring things is idolatry? You don't have to go any further than most people's credit card account to find out that they're covetous. They're wanting something that they can't afford. And you know, the scripture is given to teach us that we will not be idolaters or be covetous, wanting things that we can't afford. It says, the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and 20,000. Did you know fornication, sexual sin is rampant in our society? You know why? Because people don't go by the word of God. If you were to read the Word of God and see the damage that it does to people, if you, would, if you ever studied the life of David and saw what his adultery, what it cost him, what it cost his kids, he had children die because of it. And terrible things happen. 
I guarantee you, sin will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. And if you would study the Word of God, you'd find these things out. If you've struggled with any of these, if you've struggled with lusting after something or someone or coveting things, being an idolater or having sexual sins, then you know what? You haven't taken the example. We need to look to the Word of God, find out what happened in the Word of God, and it'll keep you from doing it. And in verse uh, 9, it says, Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Boy, murmuring, griping, complaining is rampant in our day and age. And I tell you what, God doesn't like murmurers. Now, he likes us because Jesus bore our judgment. But just because Jesus has redeemed us from this curse and God's not going to kill you because you murmur, he still doesn't like it. He put your judgment on Jesus. And if I tell you, if you could study the Word of God, you'd find out in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 46 and 47, it says, Because you do not serve the Lord with joyfulness, and gladness of heart for the abundance of all things that you have. Therefore, you're going to serve your enemies in sorrow and in grief. Now again, our judgment has been placed on Jesus. So Jesus is not going to judge you. God's not going to judge you and do the same things that he did in the Old Testament. But it still shows us that God doesn't like that. Man, we of all people are more blessed than any people that have ever walked on the face of the earth. we got no reason to be griping and complaining. I know some of you are sitting there and saying, well, you don't know my situation. Did you know 90% of all people that have ever walked on the face of the earth would fall flat of their face and just be awestruck at your level of prosperity, the gadgets, the things we have for our convenience, the comforts, air conditioning in here, all of the things that we have. We are blessed, 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 more than any group of people that have ever walked on the face of the earth. And there's still some people that are just so negative, so murmuring, such complainers that if you slit their throat with a brand new knife, they wouldn't see the good point in it. Amen. <laughs> Man, you could praise God, it's stainless steel, never been used, no germs on that knife, amen. Hung you with a brand new rope, you wouldn't be able to see the blessing in it. Boy, there's something good about everything. You know what, you could find something to praise God in. Your praise level is a good indication of your spiritual condition. If you aren't a praiser, if you aren't happy, you're religious. It usually goes over about like that. (laughs) Let's turn over to Genesis chapter 37, and we're going to begin to look at the life of Joseph. And I tell you, Joseph is a character that I've spent hundreds, maybe thousands of hours studying, and he's really impacted my life because there's only two people in the Bible that I'm aware of that never were rebuked by God. And one of them is Joseph. The other one would be Samuel. Everybody else, the Bible is real candid. It shows people's faults and mistakes for the purpose of teaching us. But Joseph is one of these guys that never was rebuked. Now, some people rebuke him and say that he was arrogant and that he caused all of these problems. And I'm going to deal with this a little bit as we go through it. But in my personal opinion, I don't believe that Joseph caused all these problems that came on him and stuff. Joseph is a guy that showed such character. It is awesome. And I can guarantee you there are dozens of major lessons that we can learn through his life. And uh, if we, you know, if you will think the same way and have the same values as somebody else, you'll get the same results. But on the other hand, you think differently than someone who is succeeding and you'll get different results. The scripture says, Proverbs 23, 7, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Your life is going the way of your dominant thoughts. Now, you might have some information, little bits and pieces of information that are correct, but it's not your dominant thought if you're failing. Another scripture that verifies that is Romans chapter 8, verse 6. It says, to be carnally minded is death 
but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Spiritual mindedness, which is not weird mindedness or religious mindedness, but it's just talking about word mindedness. Jesus said in John 6, 63, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So to be spiritually minded is to be word minded, to be thinking according to the way that God reveals in his word. And when you're spiritually minded, it's just like an equation. Spiritual mindedness equals life and peace. If you don't have life and peace, you haven't been spiritually minded. And somebody might think, well, now, wait a minute. That's true. There's just no exception to it. The first part of that verse says to be carnally minded is death. Carnal mindedness equals death. Spiritual mindedness equals life and peace. You know, I don't have to be with you when you plant your garden to tell what you planted. All I have to do is be there when it grows up. And I can tell you what you planted by what's growing in your garden. And you can sit there and say, I planted corn. But if you've got wheat growing up, you planted wheat. Either that or you let somebody else plant wheat. And you may have even had a sack that said corn. But if you've got wheat growing, I can guarantee you every seed produces after its own kind. And this is what the scripture says in dozens of different places. Your life is the way you have been thinking it to be. If you think, well, I'm only human, well, then you'll get only human results. If you start thinking, man, I'm born again. I'm a brand new person. I have the life of God on the inside of me. I am wall to wall, Holy Ghost on the inside. Then you'll start seeing miracles. But if you're going around saying, well, I'm an old sinner saved by grace, then you're going to get the results of an old sinner that's been saved by grace. But see, I used to be an old sinner. I've been saved by grace, and I'm a brand new person, and that makes a difference in the way that you receive things. The Lord has changed my life. You are changed if you're born again. Amen. Have you found Genesis 37 yet? If you hadn't found it yet, you might as well look on with your neighbor. You aren't going to get there. In uh, Genesis chapter 37, verse 2, it says, These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpha, his father's wives, and Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now, this second verse, it says that Joseph was 17 years old. This is going to figure prominently in this story later on when you see how long it took for Joseph to mature and to receive the things that God has for him. So I won't make a big point of that, but we will be coming back to this, and you need to file this away that God touched him when he was young. You know, if I had time, I'm going to have to rush through all of this stuff, but you could make a major point right here that God has a plan for every single person's life. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11 says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, before you were formed in your mother's belly, before you came forth out of your mother's womb, I sanctified you and I ordained you to be a prophet unto the nations. Galatians chapter 1, verse 15 says that God who separated me from my mother's womb under the gospel. There's a number of places. Isaiah chapter 49, verse 1, Isaiah said he was called from his mother's womb. There's four instances that I've given you right there of people separated unto God from their mother's womb. The truth is God has a purpose for every single one of us from the time of our birth and at a young age... God began to reveal himself unto every single person in here. And some of you may disagree with that and say, no, that isn't true. God was speaking. You may not have been listening. But if you would be honest, God spoke to you. There are some of you that that you had experiences. God was trying to get through to you when you were a kid. And the truth is, many of us just didn't listen to it. But just like God spoke to Joseph at a young age and started revealing himself, God will speak to you. When I was eight years old, I got born again. It's a long story, but man, it was awesome. I got totally changed. And not long after I was born again, a man came to our Baptist church and he got my mother and father and pulled them over to the corner and says, this boy is called to be a preacher. 
And uh, he took me out to eat every day for a week during that revival service and tried to get me to commit to being a preacher. But you know, at the time, all I knew was a Baptist preacher, and I knew I wasn't going to be a Baptist preacher. I just, I just knew that's not what God called me to do. So I rejected it, and I refused, and I would not surrender is what they said to preach. But you know, now that I look back at it, there was a call and an anointing of God on my life back then, and I had some things going on. Other people could see it even better than I could. But you know what? God has revealed Himself to every person. Jer- Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 20 says that the power of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness and all ungodliness of man. There is an intuitive knowledge on the inside of every person who has ever breathed that there is only one God and you are not Him. (laughs) And that you need to be dependent upon God. Now you may have denied it. The scripture talks about you can sear your conscience, you can deaden your heart and desensitize yourself to the things of God. But the truth is God starts speaking to every one of us. There's a homing device on the inside. This is the reason that before you get born again, a lot of people just can't stand to be still. They can't stand to be quiet. They've always got to have a television on or a radio on or they've got to be out with their friends doing something. They call it being bored and they just, they can't stand to be alone and to be still. When the Bible says in Psalms 46.10, be still and know that I am God. You know what happens when you get still on the inside of every person is this little homing device that God put in there and these little thoughts start floating up about Where did I come from? Where am I going? Who am I? Is this all that life is? You know what that is? That's God speaking to you, trying to get you to start thinking about what the purpose for your life is. God has a purpose for every one of you. It's not up to you to pick and choose what you want to do. God has a design on your life. You cannot just do what your own thing and ask God to bless it You've got to find out what God's purpose for your life is. Your talents, your skills, where you live, the time that you were born. Everything about you was created by God. It was designed for a specific purpose. And even though you've got freedom and God will let you do whatever you want to, you will never experience true contentment, true fulfillment, true joy, true peace, anything until you find what God has for you. And this is the very reason that even a lot of Christians aren't experiencing an abundant life is because they are trying to use God-given talents that He wants to go this way and you're over here doing your own thing and there's just not an anointing on it because you aren't doing what God has called you to do. Man, that's good preaching. All we got is into the second verse. But you know, there's a great truth here. God revealed himself to Joseph at a young age. God is no respecter of persons. Romans chapter 2 verse uh, 4 says that. That means he didn't do something special for him that he didn't do for you. God's tried to reveal himself to you ever since you were a little tiny boy or girl. And whether or not you've listened to it or not, God has a purpose. And all you got to do is still yourself and listen, seek the Lord, and God will reveal himself to you. Well, that's really important. So it says that Joseph brought his brother's evil report to their father. And in verse 3 it says, Now Israel, that's talking about uh, uh, Joseph's father, Jacob, and his name was changed to Israel. It says, Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age and he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all the brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. You know, many people criticize Joseph for telling his dreams and they say that he was arrogant and that he went about and he flaunted this and so he was a spoiled brat. And in a sense, what they do is blame him and say that he occasioned this rejection and punishment by his brothers. But this scripture right here says that their hatred for him was not based on what Joseph did, but based upon what Joseph's father did. It was actually the father that caused this hatred among the children. I tell you what, preferring one of your children 
to the uh, exclusion of others, to the point that you dislike the others and you specifically prefer one of your children above another one, that's a recipe for disaster. It was uh, Jacob that actually caused this problem, Israel, not Joseph. I don't believe that Joseph was to blame. He's not the one that caused this. What are you going to do if your father makes you a coat of many colors and gives you preference and stuff? Are you going to turn it down and reject him? I don't think that this was Joseph's fault at all. Before it mentions anything about Joseph's dreams, before it talks about what he said, any of these kind of things, it already mentions that they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him, not because of what he did, but because of what his father had done. So I think that that's important to the story right here. Joseph wasn't the one that was causing these problems. And in verse 5 it says, And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. Now there's things that he did that added to this, but I don't believe that Joseph caused it. All he was doing was speaking what God had spoken unto him. In verse 6 he said unto them, Here I pray you the dream which I have dreamed, for behold, we, are, we were binding sheaves in the field. And lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. And his brethren said unto him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us, or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. So the interpretation of this dream is pretty obvious. Here they were working in the field. Each one of them had a sheaf of wheat that they uh, stood up and all of his brother's sheaves fell down and worshipped his sheep. That's pretty obvious that that meant that Joseph was going to be exalted above, above his brothers and his brothers were going to bow down and worship him. And when he told this dream, his brothers, man, got really upset about who are you. He was the runt of the litter. He was the 11th son out of 12 and here he was claiming that he was going to have preeminence. And you know what? His own family began to criticize him. Boy, there are some lessons here. I had not got time to go through all of this, but you need to think about this. Here's Joseph at 17 years old. He's a young man. God starts revealing himself to Joseph and plants a dream in his heart. I'm going to come back to that in a minute because that's important. But the very first time that he shares this dream is with his brethren and his brothers get upset at him. Then as he shares the second dream, his father gets upset with him and even his brothers and his father turn on him and they rebuke him. Did you know Jesus said this same thing? That a prophet has honor everywhere except in his own house, in his own country, and among his own kin. David, when he went out to fight Goliath in 1 Samuel chapter 17, David went out and says, Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And he wanted to stand up and fight him. And you know the criticism, who it came from? Eliab, his oldest brother. His brother was the first one to criticize him. And you know why this is? Because the people who know you the best, I mean the people who changed your diapers when you were a kid, the people who've seen you get angry, that have seen you pout, that have seen you go through failure and know you inside and out, those people, if you start saying, God's got a call on my life, God's got something special for me to do, when you start standing up and saying, there is an anointing of God on my life, and you start separating yourself from just the normal and saying there's something special about me. God has a call on my life. The very people who know you the best, they have to do one of two things. Either they have to recognize that, you know what, I know you. You are nothing. You are nobody. And if God can use you, then that must mean I'm not living up to my potential. Or they have to either condemn you and say, you idiot, God can't use people like us. They have to either tear you down and get rid of your vision and get you out of that, or they have to change. One of the two. I don't know if you've understood that or not, but this is why that when you start standing and believing that God's got a purpose for your life, God created you. You didn't happen. Whether your parents knew you were coming or not, God knew you were coming. 
and God planned you and designed you and God has a purpose for your life, when you start saying things like this, there's going to be people that will stand up and criticize you because they don't want to believe this. They want to believe that, you know what? You can't really be used by God. Your life isn't special. We just struggle through this life and do our own thing. We're kind of like a pinball that just bang, 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 based on circumstances. You just go from place to place. They like to believe that. You know why? Because it justifies our weak, beggarly existence. Thank you for that thunderous silence. (laughs) You know, if it's true that God's got a purpose for everybody's life and that, man, your life can be supernatural, if it isn't supernatural, then it's superficial. If that's true, then you know what? That condemns a lot of people. That means that you have spent a lot of time, wasted time, and your life hasn't counted. Brothers and sisters, I'm saying these things in love. I've only got a couple of days with you, and so I just got to blast you, amen, and then I'm gone. (laughs) I'm not trying to hurt anybody. But you know what, there's some people right in here that honestly, if you died, and I know that this is hard for you to think of, but you need to think of it now while you can do something about it and change. But if you were to die, there are some of you that nobody would miss. There are some of you that honestly, your life hasn't changed another life. God didn't make you to be that way. You know, I spend millions of dollars a year on radio and television time trying to reach people and change people's lives. But every person sitting in a chair in this room has a sphere of influence, people that you can touch that have never heard of me. And if I spent ten times, a hundred times as much money as what I'm doing right now, they'll still never hear of me. You have people that you can impact You are the only Christian that some people know. You are the only person. There are people that are struggling. Their life is in a tailspin. They are having a terrible time. And you are right there. And there are many of them that don't know that you have the life of God on the inside of them. They wouldn't know that you're a Christian. There's nothing special. You haven't reached your potential. If you want to find the place on the face of the earth with the most potential, you know where to look? A graveyard. Because nearly everybody took their potential to the grave. Man, I want to get out of me everything that God's put on the inside of me so that when I'm gone, man, I can say I have finished my course. I didn't leave something undone. I didn't have something left. I've got miracles on the inside of me for people. And you know what? I want to get them all out. We brought miracles here for you. There are miracles that are going to happen and we're going to get them all out. We're going to minister to you and see things happen. Every one of you have the power of God on the inside and many of us aren't releasing it. We're just going through life and we find comfort in the fact that, well, everybody else is as miserable as I am. Nobody else seems to be ever seeing any blind eyes open, deaf ears open. I mean, that's not the way that it is today. So we come up with doctrines to say, well, those things passed away with the apostles and they don't happen anymore to make us comfortable. But the scripture says, into whatever city you enter into, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely you've received, freely give. Every one of us is given, the. he says in John chapter 14, verse 12, it says, verily, verily, that means truly, truly. And he had to put that on the front of this verse because he knew that nobody would believe it if he didn't. Truly, truly, I say say unto you, he that believes on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. The Lord said, if you are a believer, you should be doing the works that he's doing, which is healing the sick, cleansing the lepers, raising the dead, casting out devils, opening blind eyes. Every one of you in here. Did you know I don't have a gift of miracles? When I pray for people, I'm not like a Benny Hinn. I'm not against Benny Hinn. I'm saying he's got a gift of miracles and the gifts of healing. I don't. All I'm doing is taking my authority as a believer. And yet I've seen blind eyes open, deaf ears open, 
I've seen multiple people raised from the dead. My own son was dead for five hours and we spoke and he came back to life after he had turned black. And he was a white boy and he turned black. He was in a cooler on a slab with a toe tag on, stripped naked, and he sat up. Every one of us are supposed to see the dead raised, blind eyes open. And yet most of us, this isn't normal. That's abnormal. People think, well, you're a fanatic. You know all a fanatic is is somebody that's closer to God than you are. Somebody who's more passionate about God than you are or somebody who's living at a different level in God than you are, amen? This is normal Christianity. If every person in here started living up to their potential, if every person in here, we've got people from New York, Massachusetts, all over the place, all of these different countries, all of these different towns around here, if every person went out here and just started raising the dead, If you went out tomorrow and opened up somebody's blind eyes, we had a guy just Saturday night that had uh, hearing aids in both ears. And without his hearing aids, he couldn't hear a single thing. He had to read lips. And we just spoke. And he took those hearing aids out and could hear perfectly. His ears were totally open. We've already seen three or four people manifest a healing here tonight. Every one of you can do that. Every one of you. Not only can, you should. If you aren't seeing the supernatural healing power of God, you aren't living up to your full potential. And see, this is why that relatives, people who know you, criticize you and are the first to attack you because it's an attack on them if you start being different and saying there's more than what I've got. This is the reason why if you're in a church and you start standing up and speaking the Word of God, I guarantee you most churches will criticize you because if what you're saying is true, well, then the way that we've lived for hundreds of years as the church isn't true. We aren't reflecting the Lord properly, and so what do we do? Well, the simplest thing is to condemn you and make you out as being wrong. It's easier to condemn you than it is for them to change. But brothers and sisters, we need to change. And you need to recognize that God's got a plan for your life. And so here's Joseph saying, here's what God revealed to me. And they were saying, who do you think you are? Do you think that we're going to come and bow down to you? Yeah. That's what God revealed to him. And you know what? It came to pass. It may have been offensive to them, but it's only offensive to prideful people who wanted status quo and they just want to remain things the way that they are. You know what? Everything he said was true. He didn't say anything that God didn't show him. Did you know that God wants to put a dream, a vision on the inside of every one of you? The first step, the first step to being different is that you're going to have to start dreaming and thinking differently on the inside. This is the reason that Linus was up here encouraging you. How many of you know there's something more? What are you going to do with the next two years of your life? And how's what you're planning on doing with the next two years going to change eternity? It's a definition of insanity to do the same thing and expect different results. And yet there's people all of the time that they want different results, but they're just going to keep doing the same thing that they've been doing for the last ten years, and they're praying that God somehow or another change things. You know what? If you want change, do something different. And it starts with getting a dream in your heart. I know that I'm stirring some of you up and this is uncomfortable, but you know what? If you don't begin to start seeing and realizing that there's something more than what you've experienced on the inside, you'll never see it on the outside. Everything that God does comes from the inside out. You first of all have to see that God has something more for you on the inside before you see it come to pass on the outside. And there are some of you that are shooting at nothing and you're hitting it every time. You're going to have to raise your sights. You're going to have to start shooting for something. And the moment you start talking about this, fear comes into people. About, I could fail. I want you to know that if you aren't going for it and pulling out all of the stops and believing to be everything that God wants you to be, you've already failed. If you're playing it safe, you failed. God didn't call anybody to play it safe. 
Man, I've got a destiny. I've got a call on my life. And the good news is it's not just for preachers. This is for every one of you. Every one of you are called to something. God doesn't call everybody to stand behind a pulpit. <coughs> you may not be on radio or television, but like I said, there's people that you reach that I could never reach, and God wants you to be absolute uh, powerful in that situation. A leader touching people's lives, seeing people. It may be nothing but your family, but boy, you need to raise a godly family and people that know the Lord and that if Satan tries to come in and kill your son, raise him from the dead. You need to be walking in power and authority. But it all begins with a dream. If you aren't dreaming for anything except I just want a job to where I can get my rent paid and pay for my car payment and buy enough gas with the prices going up and food. Oh, if I could just get by. Oh, man. That's pitiful. That's pitiful. And yet that's where a lot of people are. Man, their goal is just to get enough so that they can get a new television, a new DVD, a flat screen TV. Uh, oh, man. That's pitiful. You know, someday all this stuff's going to be burned up. Someday all of the stuff that we are so passionate about is going to be completely gone and we're going to stand before the Lord and it's only what you've done for eternity for the kingdom of God that is going to last. I can promise you this, when we stand before the Lord, nobody's going to come up to me and say, I wish you hadn't challenged me to believe for more. I wish I'd have just kept working and got a new house, a new car. I wish I'd have got my fifth TV. I wish, you know what? All that stuff's going to be gone. You're going to come up and hug my neck and thank me and kiss me and say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for getting me stirred up so that you went and did something with your life. If you aren't living on the edge, you're taking up too much room. You ought to be out there on the edge, pushing the envelope. Amen? Amen? In verse uh, 9, it says, And he dreamed yet another dream, and told it his brethren, and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren, and his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and my, thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee to the earth? Yep. That's exactly what happened. It's exactly what came to pass. And in verse 11 it says, And his brethren envied him, but his father observed the same. In other words, Jacob or Israel protested louder than what he really felt in his heart. Jacob actually recognized that there was something to this. He began to start seeing that God had a special purpose and a special plan for Joseph. But you know, here, there's a lot of people that criticized Joseph and said you shouldn't have ever blabbed your vision. You shouldn't have ever told these things. That he caused this reaction by his brother. Again, the seed was already there. Hatred was already there. There was already rejection. And the moment you start believing different than the average person, there's going to be an immediate resistance against you just because everybody's trying to make you normal. Just like blind Bartimaeus. When Jesus came walking by, he says, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And everybody said, shh, be quiet. Don't bother him. Everybody wanted him to just stay blind. Just stay begging. They had accepted him. They will accept you as a beggar. They'll accept you if you're blind. They'll accept you if you're weak and if you've got problems. If you're sick and infirm, you can even get pity out of it. There's a lot of people that don't want to be healed because they get a lot of pity and a lot of comfort. And in our society, you can be paid for your infirmity. But you know what? Bartimaeus, he wasn't about to let somebody keep him normal. Man, Bartimaeus just yelled louder and kept screaming until finally Jesus called for him and he came and he says, What do you want? And he says, Lord, that you might, that I might receive my sight. And he said, According to your faith, so be it done unto you. Everybody wants to keep you to where just accept sickness, accept poverty, accept depression. Go around being defeated and depressed. That's what people want to tell you. I'm saying, no, that's not what God made you for. 
You know, I'm not a perfect example. I don't mean to present that, but I'm telling you that I hadn't arrived, but I've left. Amen. <laughs> and it has now been 30... How many years is that? 38 years, maybe 36 years since I've been depressed. 36 years since I've been sick. I don't get sick. Hadn't had colds. Don't get headaches. Hadn't taken a pill. Hadn't taken an aspirin. Hadn't taken a vitamin in 36 years. I don't get sick. I'm walking in health. And some of you are like, I don't believe that. Well, then it won't work for you. Amen. <laughs> but I'm telling you, you do not have to be sick. You don't have to be broke. You don't have to be miserable. You don't have to be depressed. You don't have to be fearful. You don't have to be discouraged. You don't have to And it got Joseph to dreaming that, you know what? God's got a special purpose for my life. I was 18 years old when I really encountered the Lord. I got born again when I was eight years old, but I became saved and stuck because I was raised in a denomination that taught that miracles passed away. There wasn't a baptism of the Holy Spirit. There wasn't miracles for today. It was just all about getting saved, and then the only other thing you did was get somebody else saved. And so I was doing everything they told me, but boy, on March the 23rd, 1968, I had an encounter with the Lord where, I mean, God rang my bell. And God showed me how much He loved me. And instantly, I couldn't have verbalized this. It took me years to say it. But the next morning in my Baptist church, that happened on Saturday night, on Sunday morning, I got up in front of my Baptist church. And prior to that time, I got born again when I was eight years old. And I've always been seeking after God, but I just didn't ever... It's like I never really connected. And every time that they had an invitation, and they gave an invitation, I came forward. I rededicated my life hundreds, thousands of times. If I would have had a rededicator, mine would have broken because I used it so much. I would go down... If we had seven nights worth of services, I'd rededicate my life all seven nights. I've always been seeking God and feeling like there was something more, but I didn't know how to get there. So I was always down at the front, always rededicating, always praying for God to do something. But on March the 23rd, when I had that experience, I gave myself to God with everything I had, and there wasn't anything left, and I knew it. There was nothing left for me to give, and God just filled me with so much love and so much power that I got up in front of my Baptist church the next morning, and I told them, I said, I'll never rededicate my life again. And, of course, nobody understood what I was talking about. They probably thought I'd just given up on God. I don't know. That's just like in the modern-day charismatic church. I'm desperate, oh, God. I'm desperate for you. Oh, God. I hadn't been desperate in 38 years. Man, God filled me, and I've been filled up. And Anyway, that's a whole other message. But, you know, I told him, I said, I'll never have to rededicate my life again. I said, God changed my life. And I told him, I said, I don't know what God's going to call me to do, but I said, I'm going to do it supernaturally. I said, there's power. There's anointing on my life. God's got a call for my life. And I said, I don't know what it is, but I'm going to find out. I mean, when I had this experience, intuitively I knew that God had a purpose for my life. And I started dreaming. And, you know, I didn't even know that I was going to be a minister. last thing I wanted to be was a minister. But, boy, God just put a dream in my heart. And I can tell you from my personal experience, I can tell you from David right here, I mean, from Joseph, from David, from Moses, you go through and look at anybody, and before they ever fulfilled and saw the power of God manifest in their life, first of all, there had to become a holy dissatisfaction on the inside of them with where they were. As long as you can stand to be the way you are, you will. But when you say, man, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired, and this is as far as I'm going, something's changing. I'm going to do something, even if it's wrong. (laughs) Amen. Be like those lepers sitting at the gate of Samaria, and they said, how long are we going to sit here until we die? If we stay here, we're going to die. If we go into the city, we'll die. Let's go out to the enemy and at least they, the most they can do is kill us. It says we're going to die anyway. 
It's amazing how people say, but you're talking about change and stuff, and I'm afraid. Afraid of what? Many of you are miserable where you are. What are you going to do? Be miserable number two or miserable number three? Many of you, you know the vast majority in here when Linus said, how many of you know that there's something more? The vast majority raised your hand, and yet the vast majority aren't going to do anything different but you're going to want different results. That's not the way that it works. That's like Peter getting out of the boat and the others mocked him and made fun of him for getting out of the boat and <laughs> walking on the water. But you know what? What was the difference in being in the boat? It was full of water. It was going down. <laughs> Don't leave the security of the boat, Peter. What security? It was sinking. Everybody wants to be secure. Don't go jump out here and do something stupid. Well, we've been doing something stupid. Why are we so afraid to try something different? Man, I'd rather go for it and fail and say, praise God I tried, than to never do anything. It's like a little kid riding their bike. You know what? You probably are going to fall. You probably are going to get a cut someplace. You probably won't ride it perfectly. But you know what? That father will be right there to pick you up, to help you, and to encourage you and say, get back on and go again. But the person who says, I would never ride a bike because I could fall, you'll never ride a bike. Those of you that are paralyzed by saying, I, I just can't believe for anything else. I'm just, I've got to keep status quo. You're afraid of doing anything different. You'll never change. You need to be doing something different. And you know how it starts? It starts with a dream. God brought some of you here tonight. You may have thought he brought you here to get healed or to do something else, and that may be a part of it. But you know what? God brought some of you here tonight to stir you up and to get something going on the inside of you that, you know what? God didn't make any junk. He's never made a failure. God has never created anybody to go through life sick and poor and depressed and defeated and sad, and introverted. God didn't make you that way. That's not God's calling on your life. Man, you're letting Satan run over you. And he wants to stir you up and start planting a vision on the inside of you of an, of an abundant life, of something that makes a difference. So that when you go into your family gathering and people are griping and complaining and doing all of this, some, you could come in and start sowing some seeds of positiveness Praise, talking about the goodness of God, doing something. Instead of going to work and people not even knowing that you're a Christian, man, they're, they're, you ought to stand out like a heel thumb. There ought to be a difference between you and the unsaved people that you're around. They're dead. You're alive. You've got the life of God on the inside. Instead of you feeling introverted and fearful like, oh man, are they going to make fun of me? It ought to be like they're the ones that ought to feel weird. I'm normal. Man, walking in the supernatural power of God's normal. People that don't walk in the power of God, people that don't see people raised from the dead and blind eyes open and deaf ears open and don't have joy and don't have peace and don't talk to God every day and don't hear God talk to them, that's weird. That's abnormal. Thank you for that thunderous silence. I'm trying to stir you up and let you know that, you know what, we're settling for less than what God intended us to have. I'm not here to comfort the afflicted. I'm here to afflict the comforted. Amen. I'm here to stir you up. I'm here to tell you that, man, God wants more for us. God's wanting you to be doing something big. And when you do it, Somebody says, but people might reject me. Well, sure they did. Look what they did to Joseph. Man, his brothers hated him for it. You know, I'd like to be able to tell you that if you start really believing God and standing up and taking the truth and speaking out the truth of the Word of God, that your church would accept you, that your family would accept you, that people would accept you. I'd like to be able to tell you that, but it's probably not true. You know, the Bible says all those who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. 
2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. If you aren't being persecuted, it's because you aren't living godly. If nobody's persecuting you, you are not living a godly life. You are not representing God properly. If nobody ever makes fun of you, if nobody ever talks about you, then you aren't living godly. That's what the Scripture says. You know what? If you never bump into the devil, it's because you're both headed the same direction. You turn around and start swimming upstream, there is more resistance than if you're just floating downstream. There are some of us that are just in our inner tube and we're just floating along, going with the flow, and you have zero resistance. You don't control anything. I already quoted this verse out of Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, but it says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. In other words, instead of you just floating along and que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be, and I don't know where I'm going to wind up. Oh, I hope I don't have arthritis when I get older. I hope I don't have a stroke. I hope I don't have Alzheimer's. Uh, and you're just floating along hoping that everything works out, but you don't control anything. Instead, you can start moving upstream and you can pick your destination and you can choose what you're going to be like and you can say with the Apostle Paul that I know when I come to you, I'm going to come in the fullness of the blessing of God. I know that the power of God's working on the inside of me. I know I'm not going to go out with a whimper. I'm not going to go out with Alzheimer's and of a stroke and of something else because God's Word has promised me to me. I've got some direction to my life. I've got power on the inside of me that allows me to go against the flow and to wind up at a certain place and expect it in. And I know some of you don't like this effort and this resistance. It's easier to float than it is to row. But you know what? You can choose your end. If you're rowing, if you're floating, you can't. The end results is worth the effort. And sure, people are going to reject you. Man, they rejected Jesus. They'll reject you. People speak against me all the time, but you know, it doesn't matter. What's the chaff to the wheat? Beware when all men speak well of you, for so spoke they of the prophets, the false prophets which were before you. Man, there's nothing... It's not important what people say about you. It's just not a big deal. Man, we become so touchy-feely, such wimps today. The early New Testament believers got burned at the stake, thrown to the lions, criticized, killed. Things are happening. Right now in China, there is probably the, one of the greatest persecutions against Christians that has ever happened in the history of the world. I've heard statistics, I don't know how to verify it, but up to 20,000 people a month being killed in China for their faith right now. And those people are standing and giving their life for the Lord and we're afraid to start believing God because we might lose our house. We might have somebody criticize us. Somebody might fire us from our job. Who cares? And the only thing's wrong if, if they're going to fire you for your job, and the only thing's wrong with that is that you oughtn't to even give them the pleasure. If it's that bad, you ought to go somewhere. Amen. <laughs> God's got something better for you. Psalms chapter seventy-five, I think it is, verse six. I for, I'm not sure about this. I just had a anyway. I'm not going to confess that, but someplace. <laughs> It says promotion doesn't come from the east or from the west or from the south, but it's God that puts up one and sets down another. God will take care of you. God will promote you. Brothers and sisters, whatever your reason is for not dreaming bigger, with most people it's just the fact that we're so very seldom challenged. Everybody's wanting to play it safe that we just haven't ever been challenged. But... If you're sitting there listening to me challenging you to get this dream and to go for it and you're afraid of what people are going to say, what's my family going to think? What about my job? What about my retirement? What about this and what about that? Whatever your reasons are, they aren't good enough. 
God made you for a purpose. And someday you're going to stand before God. And it doesn't matter if you were a civil engineer. It doesn't matter if you were a doctor or a lawyer. If you made lots of money. It doesn't matter if you had houses and cars. If you had the respect and the esteem of people. Someday you're going to stand before God and give an answer for the purpose and the calling that He created you for. And are you going to be able to stand there and say, I have run the race. I have finished the course. God separated me unto this from my mother's womb, and I know I'm doing what God called me to do. You know what? If you can't do that, then you need to get still. You need to go to listening to the Lord. You need to take this message tonight, and you need to start saying, Father, I need to find out your purpose. I need a dream. I need a vision. What is my life all about? What did you create me for? You can't fulfill it until, first of all, you see it on the inside. You've got to see it on the inside before you see it on the outside. And there are some of you that just haven't ever allowed yourself to dream. Maybe you've been too busy trying to survive. But I tell you what, you need to start dreaming. I'm going to have to summarize some things. I've gone long on some of these points tonight. But in this chapter, I'll just summarize it and you can read the rest of this. But... Joseph's father, Israel, told him to take some food and things and go visit his brethren who were feeding the sheep in a certain place. So he went over there, found them, and when they saw him coming, here he was wearing this coat of many colors, and they said, Behold, this dreamer cometh. You know, that says a lot right there. They despised him because his father favored him, and they despised him because he was saying, There's something special about me. And someday I'm going to rule over you and you will bow down and do obeisance to me. And boy, they hated that because of their own self-will. And so when they said, Behold, this dreamer cometh, they were talking about his vision, about his goals, the things that he had been saying. And they hated him because he was saying by the word of God that he was going to prosper and succeed above them. You know, if you truly are a humble person, it doesn't matter to you what God called you to do. If God called you to be second string, second fiddle, that's fine. Man, everybody needs a second fiddle. You know, anybody with a vision needs other people to help him fulfill that vision. We've now got, what did you tell me? We've got, I think it's 90, 89 employees and 90-something volunteers. We've got 184 people working in our ministry, and every one of them is important. If any of you have gotten tapes, CDs, books, I didn't make them. Did you know somebody else made those? And yet I bet you there's hundreds of people in here that could talk about you've been healed, delivered, God has touched your life, something has happened, and it wasn't through me, it was through these other people. Without them, you wouldn't have been blessed. I don't make our television program. All I do is sit down and teach. Somebody else runs the cameras, know how to edit it, put it on tapes, duplicate them, send them out. Somebody else is doing all of this. So anyway, what I'm saying is if your heart is right, it doesn't matter what your position is. You don't have to be the per person on the TV or the person that's getting the recognition. You just got to know what it is, what's your part. What has God called you to do? And you may want to be the one that's out front or something, but if that's not what God's called you to do, you aren't going to be satisfied and fulfilled or successful doing it. You've got to find out what God's called you to do. And so these brothers hated Joseph because he was saying that his part was bigger than their part, which was absolutely true. And so they grabbed him and they were going to kill him. And Reuben, the oldest son... He decided, well, don't kill him. He says, let's throw him in this pit so that we can say we weren't the ones that killed him. He was inferring that he would die in this pit. He couldn't get out of it. Some wild beast had killed him or something. But they, Reuben said all of that because he intended on coming back and delivering him and saving him later on. And so Reuben went on his way. And while he was gone, uh, they were sitting down and eating, which, man, there's so much in these things. But you know what? That shows a total callous... Uh, insensitivity to their brother Jacob. It says over in Psalms 105 that, uh, or excuse me, um, uh, when the uh, brothers were standing before Joseph, right before Joseph revealed who he was in Egypt, they were talking among themselves and they said, all of this has happened to us because we heard the cries 
of our brother and didn't respond to him. Now that's not written here in the 37th chapter, but it is later in the book of Genesis. And so it shows that Joseph pled for mercy and asked for mercy and they ignored him and went over and they were sitting down eating while their brother was in this pit in this terrible condition. And then they saw these Ishmaelites come by and they said, man, why don't we sell him? Instead of killing him, let's sell him and make some money off of him. And so their greed kicked in and they wound up selling Joseph and Joseph went down into Egypt and that's where this 37th chapter ends. But you know, Joseph, here's, here's another great truth. When you start believing God, some of you are going to be encouraged by the things that I say here tonight and you say, man, I'm going to believe God. I know God's got something bigger for my life than what I've been living and so I'm going to believe God and you make a declaration and you go home and tell somebody or you go to the job and say, God's got a purpose for my life and I'm going to, you know, God's going to use me. Something good's going to come out of this. And you're thinking that just instantly everything should be good. Did you know for 20 years... Actually, it was 13 years before the first good thing happened to Joseph. He was 30 years old before there was one positive thing that happened. And he was 17 at this time. So for 13 years, all he did was have bad things happen to him. And he didn't see that vision fulfilled. And so if you're one of those, it's going to be built up momentarily... And tonight, you're going to home speak your faith. Praise God. God's got a purpose for me. And then tomorrow, you go to work and tell somebody, and if they don't get excited about your vision, and instead they criticize you, or your husband, or your wife, or your kids tell you that you're crazy, or who do you think that you are? There's some of you that will fold like a $2 suitcase and wonder about why it didn't come to pass. Well, it didn't come to pass for Joseph that way either. The scripture says there is seed, time, and harvest. And sometimes it's seed and then time and then harvest. Amen. <laughs> you know what? It, you just don't plant your crop tonight and get a full-blown increase in the morning. And those of you that don't have any patience and ability to stand on something and believe God's word, this won't come to pass in your life. You know what? It's going to take some effort. And uh, it says in Psalms 105, verse 19, I believe it is, that until the word of the Lord came unto Joseph, the word of the Lord tried him. God put this vision in his heart, and there was a long time before he saw it come to pass.